Uh, I'm Russ Roberts of, the, of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. <coughs> Welcome to this special edition of Econ Talk, recorded in front of a live audience here at the Hoover Institution's Washington office. Econ Talk is part of the Library of Economics and Liberty, a weekly podcast on economics, philosophy, history, psychology, whatever I'm interested in actually, sometimes daily life. You can find us on iTunes, and our archive is at econtalk.org, where there are over 400 episodes going back to 2006. Today is February 5th, 2014, and my guests are Charles Calamiris and Stephen Haber. Charles is the Henry Kaufman Professor of Financial Institutions at Columbia University's Graduate School of Business, and he co-directs the Hoover Institution's Regulation and Rule of Law Research Initiative. St Stephen Haber is the AA and Gene Welch Milligan Professor in the School of Humanities and Science at Stanford University and a Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. Their book is Fragile by Design, The Political Origins of Banking Crises and Scarce Credit, which is our topic for today's episode. Charles and Stephen, welcome to Econ Talk. Great delight to be here. I want to start with the fundamental claim of the book. You reject the idea that bank crises are just bad luck or a perfect storm of random events. Rather, you argue that banking crises and systems are fragile by design. Steve, what do you mean by that claim and what's the justification for it? So the basic uh, idea of the book is that uh, banking systems are fragile by design because it is impossible to take politics out of bank regulation. And it's impossible to do so because there are inherent conflicts of interest between government and banking systems such that banks need governments and governments need banks. Those conflicts of interest basically boil down to three features. First, governments simultaneously regulate banks and borrow from banks. Second, governments simultaneously use their police power in order to enforce debt contracts on behalf of banks. But people who, who are being, let's say, forced out of their houses um, by, um, because they've defaulted on a mortgage are voters. And so in, in, when banking crises occur, governments often have reasons to not enforce those debt contracts. Uh, third, um, governments are in charge of liquidating failed banks. Um, but the biggest group of um, creditors to a bank when a bank is liquidated are its depositors, who are voters. Um, and so governments have incentives to uh, change the rules governing deposit insurance uh, for political ends. That is, they'll often extend deposit insurance beyond its statutory limits. Um, because of those basic, uh, those three, sort of three basic inherent conflicts of interest, it's, not, it's, it's extremely difficult um, to remove politics from banking. Governments have, or uh, parties inside the government, have an inherent um, reasons for wanting to use the banking system for their own ends. And at the same time, bankers need the government in order to do things like um, you know, enforce debt contracts. There's Finance, no getting politics out. And financing wars. A lot of yes. your book is, books a remarkable uh, history of of banking and the banking industry in five different countries and uh, credible work of scholarship and economic history combined with the political economy that we're talking about. Now, Charles, I want to talk about the game of bank bargains, which is a central concept in the book. Tell us what that is and um, where it's, uh, how do you apply it? The, the game of bank bargains is a phrase that we invented to describe the fact that the outcome of the rules of the game of banking uh, reflects political alliances that are formed between always involving the parties that are in charge of the government and some other parties that ally together and form an alliance with the government to determine the rules of the game. So the point is that in the game of bank bargains, there's going to be a group of people who are in charge. And they're going to be a group of people, often, who are left out. And it won't be a big surprise to you that the people who are in charge will use their power in this game to take advantage of the people who are left out. Of course, they're not a monolithic group. They're going not to be all. fighting among themselves for their share of that pie. No, that and in fact, the key 
And, and this is one insight that I think is important in the book. It's a little different from the way some political scientists think about um, political struggles, where they tend to think it's struggles between political parties. One of the points that we make in the book is that the coalitions that have been involved, let's say, in US history uh, to design the rules of the game of banking have often been bipartisan. In fact, they purposely have structured themselves sure. to be fairly immune to electoral partisan outcomes. And so uh, it's just as you would expect, if you wanted to have a long-lived and valuable coalition, you would want it to be fairly robust to electoral outcomes. And so sometimes you get a very unlikely partnership. People who ideologically or culturally, socioeconomically, don't really see eye to eye at all, but find a <laughs> convenience in being allies in a particular arrangement. Yeah, my, my uh, the way I think of it is the Democrats and Republicans are the same. They both like to give money to their friends. They just have different friends. But they have one friend in common, which is the financial sector. And they are both tend to scratch that sector's back and get scratched back in return, which is another way of I, I agree with what, you, what but, Steve said. But I would go even farther to mm -hmm. say that sometimes they may pretend to have different friends more than they really do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You want to give us an example? Well, you know, we're going to, I'm sure, talk a little bit about the current U.S. crisis eventually. But one of the things I think is, is really interesting is that one of the contributors to the crisis was um, mortgage subsidization policies in the U.S. Encouragement to homeownership in all kinds of dimensions. But encouraging the homeownership precisely in a particular way by creating subsidies for taking risk in the mortgage market. You can encourage homeownership in a lot of ways. Correct. But what's interesting is when we look at the last, let's say, 15 years or so of that policy, what we see is um, George H.W. Bush, followed by Bill Clinton, followed by George W. Bush, followed by Barack Obama. And even though you might think of those people as very different ideologically, they actually were part of a continuous uh, thread of very similar kinds of policies from the standpoint of some of the issues that we're talking about. And, and, you go ahead. In fact, you know, I would add to that that you know, in terms of the unlikely coalition members uh, that, that sort of sit underneath these uh, bipartisan agreements, um, in, in the case of the United States, we had activist groups allied to uh, bankers that were in the process of creating mega banks through the 1990s merger movement. Um, this, to the point that at Fed, Federal Reserve Board hearings about mergers, activists would show up, for example, from ACORN, and testify on behalf of sure. the Bank of America merging with Nations Bank. Yeah. So this is not the usual roles that you would imagine an activist group taking vis-a-vis -a, -vis a bank merger. So you've got these very unlikely partnerships that be, precisely because they straddled partisan lines were extremely durable and it made it very hard for any uh, party to deviate from the agreement. Yeah, it's um, an interesting coalition because as you point out, there are a lot of voters in these discussions. Those are the homeowners. They're clearly, there's a lot of those, but in general in democracies, large groups don't get treated particularly well. So when I see it as, as my somewhat cynical, perhaps realistic take is that they were a vehicle to give cover to giving money to these much smaller and politically powerful groups, the realtors, the home builders, and the banks who finance them through the political incentives that were inherent in the system. Well, they, they got everybody who was part of that winning coalition in the game of bank bargains did quite well, thank you. Yeah. Um, so the total amount of subsidized credit that was uh, contractually agreed as a quid pro quo for those activist groups to show up at the merger hearings, which is an understatement of the amount they actually received, was almost $870 billion over the period 1992 to 2007. So that's not chump change. Now, we, we, we've, we've gotten into the weeds a little bit here, and I think we ought to maybe do a little bit of clarifying. You're talking about the Community Reinvestment Act, which we're going to, I'm going to push back a little bit in a little, when we get to it in more detail, sure. but we should just mention here that a lot of people who blame the Community Reinvestment Act for playing a role in the 2008 financial crisis uh, get challenged by saying, well, but that law was passed in 1977. But the teeth of the law really only took place in the early 1990s when it became 
the determinant of whether a bank can merge or not. And mm -hmm. that's when it started to have an impact. Right. Well, how big that impact is, we're